Our study of the genealogy of morals is now coming to an end with this fourth video. Uh, the second one in which we're going to look at the longest essay, the third essay, which is about aesthetic ideals. And in the last one, I began from this vantage point with this tripartite distinction, this three-part drama between the warrior, the priest, and the, the herd, the mass, the common people. And um, we talked about different ways in which this drama works out. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. We also talked about different types of uh, people who would be tempted by aesthetic ideals. And we saw that the artist really doesn't have that much to do with the aesthetic ideal in a certain way. Once the artist adopts the aesthetic ideal, they, they cease doing art. Uh, fully in the, the sense that, that Nietzsche envisions. The philosopher, though, fits the aesthetic ideal quite well. There's another type that fits it even better, and that is what he calls the priest. Um, then we're, we're going to see a fourth type that we could talk about later on, and that would be the person of science, the person who's committed to a scientific worldview, um, but who really hasn't left behind the ascetic ideal, and that's where the, the, the book is actually going to more or less end. So that's where we're headed. Um, I want to put all this back up on the board again as a starting point so we can remind ourselves of the dynamic that, that's in place. We're going to come back to this in, in just a moment after making a detour uh, soon after, after going through this. So the original valuation that we have is that which is provided by the warrior class, the powerful, the strong, those who are noble, who are noble precisely because they make themselves to be noble. They impose their will upon others. They are effective uh, paragons or exemplars of the will to power at a certain point. They're also relatively simple. And as far as the human animal goes, in a certain respect, they represent um, an early stage. They don't represent the full complexity that's possible for the kind of animal that we are. That is actually represented more by the priest, who originally is coming from this same aristocratic strata that has imposed its rule upon a bunch of commoners, and not only imposed its rule, imposed its valuation of things. But the priest is different. The priest is a new type. With the priest comes the, the possibility of something greater, something deeper, something, as Nietzsche will say, more complex, but also, in a certain respect, sick. Life no longer just exuberantly imposing itself upon other life, but turning itself inward and turning itself also against the life, which is, which is so exuberant, turning itself against the warrior, and finding new possibilities, plumbing new depths, opening up the... Uh, space of a soul, as, as he talks about it. Then we have the, the herd, the ordinary people, the ones who are imposed upon. They don't create values, according to Nietzsche. The priest creates new values, new valuations. The herd don't like being imposed upon, but they don't do anything about it successfully. The only times that they actually rise up is not as individuals, but as a mass together, um, provoked by resentment against the, the upper class. And generally they only do so when they've got the driving force and organizing force of the priest actually assisting them. So that's where we start. Um, this is a common thematic in, in Nietzsche's work. Um, we live in, a, in an epoch according to Nietzsche, which is dominated by these figures. And these figures have fundamentally misunderstood who and what they are and what it means to be human. We have left behind a period that was dominated by this, but Nietzsche is not suggesting simply a return to this. If you bring up the, the term that he doesn't actually use in this book, the ubermensch, the superman, the overman, the superior human being, the one who transcends humanity and thereby realizes humanity, you won't actually find that individual in this schema. Um, and we'll see the hints of you know, where that would come about a little bit later on. 
So, why have we brought all this back up at the start? We ended by talking about philosophers and touching on priests. Well, in section 10, um, he tells us that philosophers have always had to, from the very beginning, sort of ally themselves with and place themselves under the rubric of the priestly type, the contemplative type, the one who withdraws from rule, from reality, uh, all the more to dominate that in, in return. So he says, the philosophical spirit I always had to use as a mask and a cocoon, the previously established types. The previously established types of the contemplative type would be the priest. So he says, uh, the priest, the sorcerer, the soothsayer, in any case, a religious type. Somebody who is having traffic with some sort of transcendent dimension. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting, too, because if you read Diogenes Laertes' Lives of the Philosophers, who does he actually begin with? He begins with religious types, talking about, about some of them. So he says, in order to be able to exist at all, the ascetic ideal for a long time served the philosopher as a form in which to appear, as a precondition of existence. He had to represent it so as able to be a philosopher. He had to believe in it in order to be able to represent it. The peculiar, withdrawn attitude of the philosopher, world-denying, hostile to life, suspicious of the senses, freed from sensuality, which has been maintained down to the most modern times, and has become virtually the philosopher's pose par excellence, which is, the again, the ascetic ideal, withdrawing from the purely animal, our instincts, our drives, all that sort of stuff is above all a result of the emergency conditions, Nietzsche says, under which philosophy arose and survived at all. So the ascetic priest provided until the most modern times the repulsive and gloomy caterpillar form, he says, in which alone the philosopher could live and creep about. So, you know, is this, is this true? I mean, we have some exceptions through, through time, like, uh, for instance, the Epicurean tradition, which, um, you know, you see... Maybe not Epicurus so much. He, he's, he's just saying, well, the gods are largely irrelevant to us. But Lucretius makes Epicurus into a kind of hero. But really, that only comes about <clears throat> within a certain kind of framework. Once religion has already sort of had the wind taken out of its sails. And it's interesting that in many religious texts, Epicureans are sort of the code word for atheists for those who um, not only don't fit in, but represent only a small, tiny elite, not really part of the general culture until, until modernity. Um, so he says, um, only now that we behold the ascetic priest do we seriously come to grips with our problem. So what is our problem? What is the meaning of the ascetic ideal? Only now does it become serious. We are now face to face with the actual representative of seriousness. What is the meaning of seriousness? This even more fundamental question, he says, may be perhaps trembling on our lips at the point. So, um, he says, the idea at issue here is the valuation which the ascetic priest places on our life. He juxtaposes it along with what pertains to it, nature, world, the whole sphere of becoming and transitoriness with a different mode of existence which it opposes and excludes unless it turn against itself, deny itself. In that case, the case of the ascetic life, life counts as a bridge to that other mode of existence. So, um, I'm going to actually now erase some of this schema so we can think about this, this case of the priest. So the priest is giving us a framework in which we have two kinds of worlds. We have our experienced world, which is one transitory, imperfect it's the world of becoming nature, and then we have the other world, like he says, the different mode of existence, the higher world. Which 
is more real. You might think of this in terms of Plato's two-world hypothesis. You know, the world of the forms, the ideals, and then this muddy, mucky material world in which the forms are at best represented very imperfectly as copies, or copies of copies, or copies of copies of copies, and we can keep on going on from that. So the priest says, look, the, you've got these two things, two different modes of existence, and this one only has value if it is made into a bridge, a place of process leading to this, this higher world. So you can take the material world and you can give it some value if and only if you make it a place in which these higher things are going to be realized, and that itself is done through asceticism. So he says, um, what does this mean? So monstrous a mode of valuation stands inscribed in the history of mankind, and here's a very important point, not as an exception in curiosity, but one of the most widespread and enduring of all phenomena. So Nietzsche is saying this isn't just happening in Western culture. This happens in every culture that develops to a certain point. Every culture in which you have somebody who emerges and starts to actually have some, some dynamism, some, some purchase, some, some gripping points, uh, who is different than the warriors who are imposing their rule, different from the herd who is just you know, sort of stuck with it and kind of grumbles a bit under it, and says there's more to life than what's been realized here. This happens in Japanese culture, in Arabic culture, you know, you can run through whatever you want for him. So he says, consider how regularly and universally the ascetic priest appears in almost every age. He belongs to no one race. He prospers everywhere. He emerges from every class of society. So this ascetic priest, this problematic of setting up the better but ideal world, against the worse but real world. This occurs over and over and over again throughout history, societies, cultures. He says, um, nor does he breed and propagate his mode of valuation through heredity. The opposite is the case. Broadly speaking, a profound instinct rather forbids him to propagate. So this is something that's communicated not just through um, culture, you know, in the sense of like, you know, reproduction, <clears throat> but through ideals, through ideas that can be grasped, can be transported from culture to culture. And he says here, um, it must be a necessity of the first order that again and again promotes the growth and prosperity of this life inimical, inimical species, an enemy to life. It must indeed be in the interest of life itself that such a self-contradictory type does not die out. Now, where is life, actually? This is life. But this also is life. This is something that's ideal, but it is also something that life generates so as to be able to critique itself, to be able to criticize itself, to be able to turn against itself. Life itself is so contradictory, so malleable that it produces out of its own plentitude that which goes against it. He says, an ascetic life itself is a self-contradiction. Here rules a resentment without equal, that of an insatiable instinct and power will that wants to become master, not over something in life. The, the warrior wants to become a master of something in life. Other warriors, when they clash, the herd, they want things, they want to impose, but their wants and demands are local. Even if they want to have a, a world empire, they just want to be the top dog in all the, the world. The priest, Nietzsche says, wants to dominate life itself. A will to power that wants to become master not over something in life, but over life itself, over its most profound powerful and basic conditions. An attempt is made to employ force to block up the wells of force. Here, psycho physiological well-being itself is viewed askance, and especially the outward expression of this well-being, beauty and joy, while pleasure is felt 
and saw it, there's still pleasure being looked for in ill-constitutedness, decay, pain, mischance, ugliness, voluntary deprivation, self-mortification, self-flagellation, self-sacrifice. And he says all of this is in the highest degree paradoxical. So the priest, oops, the priest is in fact a paradox, a complicated configuration of things that seems to go against everything that we would, we would think. It doesn't seem to make sense. Now, for a philosopher, when something doesn't make sense, what do you do? You dig in deeper. You start thinking about it more. And here we have an interesting thing to look at. Nietzsche in section 12 is actually revealing to us a really important thing about his method. So, he says, suppose such an incarnate will, the contradiction and anti-naturalness is induced to philosophize. So let's say the priest, this paradoxical priest philosophizes. Upon what will it invent its utmost, innermost contrariness? Upon what is felt most certainly to be real and actual. It will critique the real and the actual. It will look for error precisely where the instinct of life uh, most unconditionally posits truth. It will, for example, he says, like the ascetics of the Vedanta philosophy, there's an Indian, uh, you know, orthodox Indian philosophy, uh, downgrade physicality to an illusion. Likewise, pain, multiplicity, the entire conceptual antithesis, subject and object, errors, nothing but errors. So philosophy, by working in the realm of the ideal, will actually banish, or at least claim to banish, these things that are real. Why does it do that? Here we're getting to something that's really important. The paradox is made explicable if we understand things in terms of pleasure. He says, to renounce belief in, what, in one's ego, to deny one's reality, what a triumph, not merely over the senses, over appearance, but a much higher kind of triumph, a violation and cruelty against reason, a voluptuous pleasure that reaches its height when the ascetic self-contempt and self-mockery of reason declares there is a realm of truth and being, but reason is excluded from it. So what is the ascetic doing? They're using the most complex, the most adaptable of the human faculties to generate a paradox going beyond reason. That paradox is not only something that they're generating, it's in them. It's part of what's going on in their drives. The priest is in a certain respect sort of like at the very crux of life itself, which is contradictory and paradoxical for Nietzsche. So, he says, that we're actually getting somewhere now. He says, if we want knowledge, if we're going to be philosophers, let's not be ungrateful to such resolute reversals of unaccustomed perspectives and valuations. To see differently in this way for once, to want to see differently, is no small discipline. That's one of the things the philosopher does, to want to see differently to want to reverse things, to change things, to see, can this work? Can this make sense? And he says, um, we have two different ways we can look at this. The philosopher, now I need to do some more erasure, the philosopher and the priest, and actually the man of science, They want to be objective. They want a truth that is impersonal, that is not committed, that could be the same for everybody across the board. That is the hallmark of truth for, for many people. So he says, um, objectivity. What is objectivity? Is it understood as contemplation without interest? Is it disinterested? Does it have to detach itself from 
the self, from the individual, from their actual conditions? He says, no. It's the ability to control one's pro and con and to dispose of them. So one knows how to employ a variety of perspectives and effective interpretations in the service of knowledge. A very interesting idea. So, instead of having objectivity, impersonal, disinterested, and basically just one perspective, no affects or feelings being involved, what's the alternative? The self dominates and makes use of many perspectives. Multiple affects. Like he says, the self controls one's pros and cons and disposes of them. One knows how to employ a variety of perspectives. One looks at things from a number of different angles, not just one single one. And affective interpretations in the service of knowledge. And he says, let's be on guard against the dangerous old conceptual fiction that posited a pure, willless, painless, timeless, knowing subject. Let us guard against the snares of such contradictory concepts as pure reason, which would be over here. Absolute spirituality, there's Hegel, absolute spirit, knowledge in itself. These always demand that we should think of an eye that is completely unthinkable, an eye turned in no particular direction, in which the active and interpreting forces, through which alone seeing becomes seeing something, the stuff over here, are supposed to be lacking. That's, a, that's nonsense, he says. There is only a perspective seeing, only a perspective knowing. The more affects we allow to speak about one thing, the more eyes, different eyes, we can use to observe one thing, the more complete will our concept of this thing, our objectivity, be. So Nietzsche is saying if we actually want genuine objectivity, it's not over here in the impersonal. This is where objectivity lies, and it's by forming a kind of composite view of things that are of perspectives and affective interpretations, feeling interpretations, desired interpretations, that may not actually all jive together, but can be forced into at least juxtaposition with each other. That's Nietzsche's method. That's what he's advocating. That's what it would mean to follow in Nietzsche's footsteps here. So let's go on now, and let's go back to um, talking about the priest, the herd, the warrior. So he says, and this is in uh, section 13, what are we concerned with? Um, this ideal. How did this ideal acquire such power? How did it rule over people? He says, um, it ruled over men as imperiously as we find in history, especially where the civilization and taming of man has been carried through. And it expresses a great fact. This is a very important point. The sickliness of the type of man we have hitherto, or at least of the tamed man, and the physiological struggle of man against death, or more precisely, against disgust with life, against exhaustion, against desire for the end. So... Where is this centered? It's centered on the priest, but the priest is himself sick. The herd is also sick. And the priest will actually make even the warrior sick in return. So the priest is going to end up in culture as Nietzsche is, is seeing it here. The priest is going to end up in the higher position. or at least on the same level as the warrior. And 
the herd will lie below. Now what's going to happen with this? Well, he's, he's talking about this sickliness, and he continues in chapter 14. He says, The more normal sickliness becomes among men, the higher should be the honor accorded to rare cases of great soul and body, man's lucky hits. Um, that would be the warrior, right? The ones who are able to sort of assert themselves. They have that sort of, and they don't know where they get it from, and it's just kind of luck of the draw, but they have that power, that dynamism. He says, is this what we do? Do we accord a great honor to them? It says, the sick represent the greatest danger for the healthy. It's not the strongest, but the weakest, who spell disaster for the strong. Is this no? It says, broadly speaking, it's not fear of man that we should desire to see diminished. This fear compels the strong to be strong. If you have somebody to match yourself against who is healthy, who actually has, you know, drives, affects that are, that are fairly simple, straightforward, directional, you can clash with them. They can be your rival. They can become your friend. They can become your enemy. Um, there's all sorts of possibilities for a sort of genuine, authentic engagement with them. Not so with the herd. Not so with the, the priest, though. He says, what is more to be feared? is that man should not inspire profound fear, but profound nausea. Nausea, sickness. And he says, not only, not, also not great fear, but great pity. And he says, suppose the two were one day to unite, they would inevitably beget one of the uncanniest monsters, the last will of man, his will into nothingness, nihilism. When our picture of human beings no longer is motivated by looking to the strong. And maybe I should get rid of the word warrior here, and we should just think in terms of the strong. Because the warrior could be somebody in politics, the warrior could be somebody in artistic culture who says, screw you, I'm going to do what I, what I want with these materials, and if you don't like it, too bad, because that's, that's what I'm doing. And maybe they actually succeed on the basis of that. It could be somebody even in fashion, perhaps. It could be somebody in business. It could be all sorts of things. But the strong are able to stick by themselves and say, I am going to follow through on this. I am going to impose my good versus other people's bad. Um, if instead we are thinking in terms of the herd and in terms of the, the valuation that the priest gives, then we're at risk, instead of having fear when looking to these kind of individuals, of having pity and feeling this kind of sickness. So he says, um, the sick are man's greatest danger. Not the evil, not the beasts of prey, not the exploiters, not the tough guys, not the ones who are able to impose their will. The sick are the greatest danger. Those who are failures from the start, downtrodden and crushed, it is they, the weakest, who must undermine life among men who call into question and poison most dangerously our trust in life, in man, and in ourselves. Where does one not encounter that veiled glance which burdens one with a profound sadness, that in return glance of the born failure, which betrays how much a man speaks to himself, that glance which is a sigh. Beautiful passage there. A glance which is a sigh. The person who feels bad for themselves, they feel that they've gotten the, the, the you know, bad end of the stick, they've gotten a raw deal. If only things had been differently, they would have been such a great person. But they didn't make it happen, and they're not going to make it happen. He says, it is on such soil, swampy ground, that every weed, every poisonous plant grows, always so small, so hidden, so false, so saccharine. Here the worms of vengeance, vengefulness, and rancor swarm. Here the air stinks of secrets and concealment. Here the web of the most malicious of all conspiracies is being spun constant, constantly. The conspiracy of the suffering against the well-constituted and victorious. Here the aspect of the victorious is hated. The herd hates the successful. 
hates the powerful. And what mendaciousness, what lying abilities, is employed to disguise that this hatred is hatred? So that's part of what's going on with resentment. Resentment has its origin in sort of being pushed into the lower position and having to take it and hating that and reacting against that, but not being able to express that directly and having to conceal it and having to make it, as we say, passive aggressive, having to make it become, you know, uh, a little bit less overt. And it, with time, this starts to become part of one's being part of one's character. There can be entire cultures and institutions of resentment going on. Um, so he says, what do they really want? What do the lowest want? At least to represent justice, love, wisdom, superiority. They also have a will to power. They also want to dominate. And the only way that they can dominate is by making the strong feel and look bad and thereby sort of elevating themselves and their mind above them. He says, and how skillful such an ambition makes them. Admire above all the forger's skill with which the stamp of virtue, even the ring, the golden sounding ring of virtue is here counterfeited. They monopolize virtue. These weak, hopelessly sick people, there is no doubt about it. We, are, we alone are the good and just, they say. We alone are the homines bonae voluntatis, the, the men of good will. They walk among us as embodied reproaches, as warnings to us, as if health while constituted as strength, pride, and the sense of power were necessarily vicious things. So what's going on here is, is a transvaluation of values that where the herd is trying to place itself above the strong. But it does so because of the priest, because of the ascetic ideal that's going on. It talks about the will of the weak to represent some, some form of superiority, their instinct for devious paths to tyranny over the healthy. And he says this goes on everywhere. Examine the background of every family, every organization, every commonwealth. Everywhere the struggle of the sick against the healthy. A silent struggle as a rule with petty poisons, with pinpricks, with sly long-suffering expressions. Um, and he goes on and he gives a lot of examples here, so I'm actually going to skip over these. Now he, he, he labels this resentment. And resentment means a number of different things for Nietzsche. We're actually not going to have time to cover all the different modalities of that, that here. I'll see if I can do that in a core concept video down the line. Um, the point is, there is a kind of concealment of what one is really feeling, what one is really expressing, and the way in which resentment works is by denigrating something that has genuine value and trying to pull it down and thereby to pull oneself up. So now he goes on and he talks a little bit more about the danger here. He says, no greater or more calamitous misunderstanding is, is possible than for the happy, the well-constituted, powerful and soul and body to begin to doubt their right to happiness. So when the strong, when the people who break the mold, when the people who go their own way are actually starting to believe this and feel like, mm, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. Maybe I should respect everybody's rights. Maybe everybody does actually have rights. Um, rather than people have rights if they can actually defend them or they can impose them. When they start to believe that, then we have a problem. He says, then they begin to doubt their right to happiness. And he says, if this happens, the healthy should be segregated from the sick. But how can that happen? How can we make that, that take place? It says, the higher ought not to degrade itself to the status of an instrument of the lower. The pathos of distance ought to keep their tasks eternally separate. Their right to exist, the privilege of the full tone bell over the false and the cracked is a, hundred time, is a thousand times greater. They alone are a warranty for the future. They alone are liable for the future of man. The sick are not the future of, of human beings. But what can we do? Who's going to take care of the sick? Are the healthy going to take care of the sick? If they do that, they're going to become sick. If they, like Nietzsche says, if they degrade themselves to the status of an instrument of the lower, they become lower. 
they become infected. So he says, if you've grasped this in all its profundity, you've also grasped one further necessity. The necessity of doctors and nurses who are themselves sick. Who are the doctors and nurses? The priest. The priestly class. Those who fit the priestly type. And now we've noticed too, this is not just priests, this is also the majority of philosophers. Even certain artists, if they are, you know, for, forgetting what it means to be an artist. And we're going to also see men of science, or, you know, scientists, those who are committed to a sort of scientific, naturalistic, in a sort of banal sense, worldview. So he says, um, we must count the ascetic priest as the predestined savior, shepherd, and advocate of the sick herd. That's his mission. He has to be sick himself. How else would he understand the sick? He must also be, at the same time, strong master of himself, even more of others, with his will to power intact, so as to be both trusted and feared by the sick, so as to be their support. So there has to be a, a distance between the priest and the herd. The priest cannot simply be of the herd, cannot just be their representative. He has to actually exert power on them, shape them, direct them, form them. And he says, um, the priest is... Uh, having a war with the beasts of prey, a war of cunning rather than one of force, so he's fighting with them, but he also is defending them, against, he's defending the herd against the strong as well. But he's not just defending the herd against the strong. Here's a really interesting point. Nietzsche says, he defends his sick herd against itself, against the baseness, spite, malice and whatever else is natural to the, to the ailing and sick and smolders within the herd itself. And what, what does he mean there? Again, resentment. The priest is helping to redirect or staunch the flow or, or hem up this current of resentment that flows not only within the priest but also within the herd and some, in somewhat different ways within both of them. He says the priest alters the direction of resentment. What does he mean here? He doesn't, again, this is not all of Rizantimont, but this is one of its modalities. He says, every sufferer instinctively seeks a cause for his suffering. More exactly, an agent. Somebody who can say, that person made me suffer. That person took my opportunities away from me. That person is the reason why I'm not happy. Envy. Rancor. Sort of imaginary revenge. That's what Nietzsche thinks that most people are actually motivated by, including the priest. But more particularly, the people who are down below. The people who are stuck in the cubicles. The people who are taking it, you might say. So he says, every sufferer seeks a cause, an agent, still more specifically, a guilty agent who is susceptible to suffering, who you can make suffer in return. In short, some living thing upon which he can, on some pretext or another, vent his affects, vent his feelings, vent this desire to, to, to hurt in return. Actually, you're an effigy. For the venting of his aspects, affects sorry, represents the greatest attempt on the part of the suffering to win relief, Anastasia. There's a feeling that if you can just vent, if you can just say, well, you know, my life might be crap, but theirs is crap too. Not only you feel a little bit better, but that's dangerous. That's poisonous, Nietzsche thinks. In bringing the high down to the level of the sick, the failure, the dead end, the unable to stand up for itself, the simply taking it, it's not actually making their condition better. It's not actually fixing things. So he says, this constitutes the physiological cause of resentment, vengefulness and the like, a desire to deaden pain by means of affects. And re remember back to what we were saying just a few minutes before, the philosopher, if the philosopher is actually going to develop genuine aff objectivity, they have to look at things through the lenses of multiple affects. Affects that are good and affects that are bad. You have to 
look look at different affective interpretations and then you know sort of try to put them together. It's the only way that you can actually know this. So he says, the suffering are one and all dreadfully eager and inventive in discovering occasions for painful affects. They enjoy being mistrustful and dwelling on nasty deeds and imaginary slights. They scour the entrails of their past and present for obscure and questionable occurrences that offer them the opportunity to revel in tormenting suspicions and to intoxicate themselves with the poison of their own malice. They tear apart their oldest wounds. They bleed from long-heeled scars. They make evildoers out of their friends, wives, children, and whoever stands closest to them. I suffer. Someone else must be to blame for it. Nietzsche says, this is what the sheep thinks, the sickly sheep. And then the ascetic priest says to him, quite so, my sheep, someone must be to blame for it. So who's to blame for it? Here's the most important transformation. So the ascetic sheep feels resentment against the strong. What the priest does turns this backwards against him and says, quite so, someone must be to blame for it. You know who that somebody is? You. You're to blame for where you are. Not because you're a failure or something like that, but because there's something in you. Some other kind of failure, other than just not standing up to the strong. A moral failure. A religious failure. A spiritual failure. So he says this directs, this changes the direction of resentment. Now, how is this done? And Nietzsche is saying this is done actually through um, the control of affects. So now, again, we have to do a little bit more erasure. Um, what are the fundamental problems that the priest is dealing with on the part of the, the herd? And also on, on his own part. Well, part of it is resentment. This, you know, urge to say, those other people are the bad ones. I'm not the bad one. They're the bad ones. I want to hurt them somehow. I can't hurt them physically. I can't actually hurt their stuff. I'm going to call them names. I'm going to tear them down. I'm going to whisper behind their back. I'm going to convince myself that I'm a good person. They're bad people. So that's resentment. Another thing that they have to struggle with, feeling of guilt. This goes along with it, and it's sort of like the flip side of it. And then, what he earlier called uh, nausea, and we'll also call depression. And how are you going to deal with these? How to purify the person, how to redirect these, these forces so that they don't feel so bad, so that they're not bothered by this stuff, which they are genuinely bothered by, by introducing other affects, remedies. And some of these are what he called the innocent ones, and some are the ones that he calls the guilty ones. So let's actually uh, look through some of these, and let's look at each one of these things. So he says, um, it's a matter of directing the resentum onto the less severely afflicted sternly back onto themselves, uh, and in that way to exploit the bad instincts of all sufferers for the purpose of self-discipline, self-surveillance, and self-overcoming. Um, he says that, that another problem going on with this is a feeling of psychological inhibition. With this nausea, this depression, it's almost bound to seize on large masses of people, uh, though they don't diagnose it as, as such. Um, he talks about this as a dominating sense of displeasure. Now, how do we actually deal with this? What are the different means? Well, 
One, he says, this dominating sense of displeasure is combated first by means that reduce the feeling of life in general to its lowest point. If possible, will and desire are abolished together. All that produce affects and blood is avoided. So this is definitely ascetic, right? You avoid affects, avoid desire. That's one means. No love, no hate, indifference, no revenge, no wealth, no work. One begs if possible, no women or as little as possible. Um, the result expressed in, he says, moral psychological terms is selflessness or saintliness, sanctification. In physiological terms, he calls this hypnotization. The person hypnotizes themselves, in effect. The attempt to win for man an approximation to what in certain animals is hibernation. So the, the life of the ascetic uh, monk, for example, you know, think about um, the role of fasting for Christian monks or um, the, the fact that Buddhist monks aren't supposed to eat afternoon. Just limiting the flow of food already tends to allow you some surcease to certain affects. Um, now he goes on and he says... Um, there's some, there's some compensations that come with this. It can open the way to all kinds of spiritual disturbances, to auditory and visual hallucinations, to voluptuous inundations and ecstasies of sensuality, as in the case of you know, St. Teresa of Avila. Uh, it says it goes without saying the interpretation with which these, with those subject to these states place upon them has always been enthusiastic and false as possible. But we should not overlook the note of utterly convinced gratitude. So what goes along with the voiding aspect is a kind of compensation with feeling other affects, including feeling pleasure. By diminishing one's pleasure, one gives oneself a different kind of pleasure as a compensation. Um, so that's what he calls redemption. What's another possibility? what he calls mechanical activity. Find yourself a routine and stick to it. He says a, a different training against states of depression, which is at any rate easier, mechanical a activity. Mechanical activity and what goes with it, such as absolute regularity, punctualist and unthinking obedience, a mode of life fixed once and for all, a fully occupied time, a certain permission, indeed training for impersonality, for self-forgetfulness, taking you away from the feelings that you have and just losing yourself in what it is that you're doing, whether it be sweeping, bottling wine, mowing the grass, pick whatever you like, sewing up the wounded. Um, how thoroughly, how subtly the ascetic priest has known how to employ these in the struggle against pain. Some people are able to lose themselves in the activity that they engage in. He says another one, another more highly valued means of combating depression is the preaching of a small pleasure, a petty pleasure, pleasure of giving pleasure. Make other people happy and you'll be happy. That's another thing that's counseled in, in religion by the priest. Actually, in all sorts of things, isn't it? So he says, um, doing good, giving, relieving, helping, encouraging, consoling, praising, rewarding, love of neighbor. The ascetic priest prescribes fundamentally an, excite, an excitement of the strongest, most of life affirming drive, the will to power. The pleasure of giving other people pleasure, of helping out, Nietzsche thinks is actually a way of subtly placing yourself above the other person and enjoying being able to look down upon them and say, look how good I am. I am able to be good to you who cannot be good to me. So this happiness of slight superiority involved in all doing good, being useful, helping and rewarding, is the most effective means of consolation. He also talks about formation of a herd.
because herd people like being together. They like thinking the same way. They like being in a group that all sees things the same way. It says, uh, the sick and sickly instinctively strive after herd organization as a means of shaking off their dull displeasure and feeling of weakness. Um, so, these are all what, what Nietzsche calls, by modern standards, innocent means in the struggle for displeasure. These are all ways in which, traditionally, religions and other, you know, organizations, um, you know, you can think of, you know, philosophical groups, uh, where, where philosophy actually had some sort of role in society, have tried to make people feel better about these things, resentment, of guilt, and depression. Avoid affects, which will give you pleasure later on. Find some mechanical activity to engage yourself in. Give other people pleasure. Get together with other people. Now he says that uh, there are also some more interesting means, the he says, guilty ones. They all, they all involve one thing. So there's another possibility too. An orgy of feeling employed as the most effective means of deadening dull, paralyzing, protracted pain. So how do you produce an orgy of feeling? How do you bring that about? Um, he says, to wrench the human soul from its moorings, to immerse it in terrors, ice flames, and raptures to such an extent that it is liberated from all petty displeasure, gloom, and depression by a flash of lightning. What paths lead to this goal? Which of them do it most surely? So fundamentally, every great affect has this power, provided it explodes suddenly. So, producing the affects itself... What are these? Anger, fear, voluptuousness, revenge, hope, triumph, despair, cruelty. And the ascetic priest is indeed pressed into his service indiscriminately the whole pack of savage hounds and man and let loose now this one, now that. Always with the same end in view, to awaken men from their slow melancholy, to hunt away, if only for a time, their dull pain and lingering misery. And he says, every such orgy of feeling has to be paid for afterwards it makes the sick sicker. And that's why the cure, the kind of cure for pain is by modern standards guilty. Think about our own culture and the ways in which we give people the possibility to like have an instant rush of a particular feeling. Just get on the, on the web and you can find all different ways to make yourself feel anger, to, to lighten your day, all sorts of things like that. I actually, myself, I know I like to go at least once a day and look at um, sites that will help me to have a real laugh. So I suppose from Nietzsche's perspective, perhaps I would be guilty of this myself. Um, I want something that will actually, like, you know, force me to laugh. Not just, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of there and ha, 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 chuckle or something like that. Where the affect will, in a sense, take me over. An almost ec ecstatic experience. So Nietzsche is saying this can be done with all sorts of other affects as well. And that's one way to deal with this. And that's one thing that the priest has been doing generally through religious narratives. You should think, however, about plenty of other alternatives, you know. Um, when people are getting exuberant over a political candidate and now the world is going to be so much brighter and changed or, oh, the world has gone to crap because this person was elected. Are they maybe doing what, what Nietzsche is talking about? Is somebody offering them that as a panacea against these, these things that have to do with their actual condition? Now, the last thing that we have to talk about is the movement away from the ascetic priest and the ascetic ideal of the priest to something different. So, we have uh, a shift historically that's taking place. And... We have the priest, and we have the era of religion, 
And this goes all the way back to prehistory, right? The religions, some of them emerge with history. Uh, some of the earliest texts that we have are, are religious texts. And the priest on the way produces the figure of the philosopher. And from the philosopher, really, you know, from both the priest and the philosopher. You know, if you think about modern science, it didn't have its origin in, in people, you know, saying, ah, get rid of religion or something like that. It was actually a lot of religious people who well, laid the foundations of modern science, uh, and not just in one religion, but it's interesting, too, because a lot of the, the important early thinkers had, had a lot of religious convictions. Some of them were even uh, priests. Um, I'm going to use the sexist, you know, man to, to encompass person of science. It's a mindset. Or does the ascetic ideal continue? Well, what does Nietzsche tell you? He says, it is a great phrase, this is in section 24. It says, these naysayers and outsiders of today who are unconditional on one point, their insistence on intellectual cleanliness, these hard, severe, abstinent, heroic spirits who constitute the honor of our age, all these pale atheists, anti-Christians, immoralists, nihilists, these skeptics, heretics of the spirit, these last idealists of, of knowledge, they certainly believe that they are as completely liberated from the ascetic ideal as possible. These free, very free spirits. And you can think about this today. Some of these people who get on atheist websites and they are just like crusaders. They're not free of the ascetic ideal. They're just continuing it under a different guise. They've managed to throw away the trappings of institutional religion. As a matter of fact, they spend most of their time occupied with purifying themselves of institutional religion and trying to purify the world of it. But they, just as much as the priests, believe in a transcendent truth that they are somehow in touch with. And Nietzsche uh, says that this is at the bottom of science. He says, it's a metaphysical faith that underlies our faith in science. And we men of knowledge today, we godless men and anti-metaphysicians, we still derive our flame from the fire ignited by a faith millennial old, the Christian faith, which was also Plato's, that God is truth, that truth is divine. So he says, if that's the case, then modern atheism is doing something really just no different than ancient religion and medieval religion was doing. It's doing the same thing. It's the same ascetic ideal. It says science never creates values. Its relation to the ascetic ideal is by no means entirely antagonistic. It might even be said to represent the driving force in the latter's inner development. It opposes and fights not the ideal itself, but only a particular shape of that ideal. It takes the the, the, the baton and, and starts moving forward, you might say. So he says, um, I'm going to skip on ahead a little bit more. Um, talks about history as well in this sort of thing. So he says, um, Christianity as a dogma was destroyed by its own morality. It was destroyed by what it gave rise to, in part modern science, but also in part a sort of more pure morality. And in the same way Christianity's morality must perish too, and he says we, sent, we stand on the threshold of this event. And he says the ascetic ideal has only one kind of real enemy capable of harming it. The comedians of this ideal, for they arouse mistrust of it. It's not the man of science, the um, Dawkins and, and Hitchens and people like that, you know, in, in respect to the atheist versus Christian types of, of things. Um, it's actually the comedians of the ideal, he says. They arouse mistrust of it. Everywhere else, that spirit is strong, mighty, and at work without counterfeit today. It does without ideals of any sort. The popular expression for this abstinence is atheism, except for its will to truth. So, where do we go from here, Nietzsche says. He says, here's the fundamental problem. What meaning would our whole being possess 
if it were not this, that in us the will to truth becomes conscious of itself as a problem. So these people are all inhabited by the will to truth as sort of unacknowledged, unthought through. What about those who can problematize this, those who see that as a problem for themselves? Because you can't just make this into a philosophical problem which you're going to handle off on the side or a scientific problem or a religious problem. It has to become an existential problem one which is posed for the very person who is asking it. What is the will to truth in me? If I don't ask it that way, Nietzsche would say, if I only ask it for others or for human being as such, I'm not truly asking it. So the will to truth becomes conscious of itself as a problem. That's the only way in which the ascetic ideal can be overcome.